do not have this personal ownership per se of one thing over another or ownership of things isn't used in a hierarchical capacity. The aspects of, of both nature and culture that we pass on to future life, uh, human and non-human. So it's things like the water, the air we breathe, um, it includes the electromagnetic spectrum, so the airwaves over which TV and radio are broadcast. Uh, it's also cy cyberspace in the airwaves, all, all which should be democratically controlled. The basic resources that we rely upon, but also things like DNA, um, um, those basic things that nature passes on from generation to generation that we have in common. was always a part of history that the physical earth belongs to all of us. There were these ideas that, that it was usury was wrong, there are usury laws. The law of the land literally referred back in 13th century England, it literally referred to the land as the land that people fertilized and tilled and grew their crops on. Our food and our fuels all came from what was held in common. But then the development of cities, and with cities came uh, concentrations of wealth and power, and with that the enclosure of the commons uh, happened. You see it kind of manifest in the architecture of towns, or you see it in the development of communities. So there's a place for the commons. The, those, those norms that developed and, and were sustainable were very much a part of what we've inherited. And with that we've lost more and more of the natural commons, and more and more of the cultural commons has been what we've moved toward. When we talk about a crisis of the commons, water is a good example because in an age in which everything is bought and sold, uh, private corporations would have water be treated as just another commodity. The problem with that is that, of course, water is essential to life, and so it's not like any other commodity. I think of what we had when we were growing up, and that way of life is gone. To have a, prof a hospital run for profit what was considered actually pathological back then would not have been allowed. And yet now, again, corporations uh, run and profits are made off of everything that's uh, held in common and, and in trust. Often in, in our society, we look at prices as monetary values, and we don't see them, uh, we don't see values measured in other ways. Um, but I think uh, an invitation to getting people to understand the importance of the protection of commons as a concept would lead to things like food or water or air because everybody does use those things or need those things. The idea that these are things that are held in common because we depend, we all depend on them and therefore we should share equally in them. We need to be talking about um, and value what is common to us and what really gives us life. I think education and dialogue and being open and again not succumbing to reacting to the language and, and the structures of the enclosure movements but literally by example doing something else. Having movements that start um, with signatures going to the state senate so we can get corporations to pay a certain percent of the tax. So fighting um, efforts by corporations to privatize these is, is the most fundamental act that we can engage in in order to preserve our common heritage. That's why it's really important for the Occupy movement itself and the 99% movement itself to really be subsumed with the notion of the commons, the rights to information, the rights to publicly assemble. There has to be an active citizenry. The commons will not be protected without defenders and supporters and um, entrepreneurs and donors and all of that. We have to show up in, in, uh, in a number of dimensions to begin to define and protect the commons. I think the most important people we need to thank are Dwarf. Dorothy and Alfred Anderson because without their support we wouldn't have the website, we wouldn't have the film, we wouldn't be able to go forth with the message.